you know, when they say on cops, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say will be used against you in the court of law. You have the right to an attorney, and if you cannot afford one, one will be appointed for you. Yeah, well, we're going to talk about the one today and the whole backstory as to why there are Miranda rights and what is Miranda rights. We're going to go a little bit back in time. March 2nd, 1963. Imagine. 18 year old Patty McGee, she was working at a movie theater. She was one of the concession stand workers and it's been a really long night. The movie was called The Longest Day and it was like over two hours long and a part of her job required her to stay until all the movie goers had left the theater. So that night she left around after 11 p.m. and it was just like any other travel home, she bussed two buses and a little distance of a walk to get home. This time, her and her co-worker had finished at the same time, and he and her went on the first bus together. He got off a stop before her, she got off the next stop, she transferred, went on to her next bus, and she got to 7th and Maryland Avenue. It's in this like industrial area of Phoenix, Arizona. Basically when she got off, she just had to walk for a couple minutes and she would be at home. When she got off the bus, she had noticed this car coming out of the driveway going towards her and had stopped maybe a block before her. And a man had exited the car and started to walk in her direction. And once again, she didn't think, you know, very much of this, right? It is, you know, Phoenix, Arizona, and people were doing their own things. So she took a little bit into account how the man looked as he was walking towards her, but, you know, she was just focused on getting home. Just as the man was about to pass her, he grabbed Patty. He held onto her arm and he said, Don't scream. Do not scream. Patty pleaded with him. Patty was like, please let go. Please don't do anything to me. But he slowly overpowered her and took her to his vehicle. He tied her hands and feet together, put her on the back floor of his back seats, and then decided to drive 20 minutes while she was laying there. They drove 20 minutes to the outskirts of Phoenix. It's called the High Deserts. When they arrived there, he raped her and he after demanded to get the f any sort of money that she had on her. And at the time, Patty only had $4 in her pocket and he took that from her. She was placed back on the ground of the backseat vehicle, this time with his jacket on top of her to conceal a person from being in the back of his vehicle. And he dropped her just a few blocks from where he initially had picked her up and left. So Patty immediately, you know, went home. She was petrified. She was so scared, man. She was so scared. McGee's decided to, you know, call the police and take her right away to the hospital. They took her to the Good Samaritan Hospital. And doctors there did agree that she had signs of an assault. When the police started to be involved in this, they initially didn't really want to take this seriously, but it had to do with some more vagueness. The statement that she gave police was that the man was in his 20s. He was about six feet tall, he was slender, he was of a Hispanic background, and he wore a t-shirt, pants, and glasses. She described the interior of his vehicle, and that's as much as she really knew. Patty started to give conflicting versions of the stories in the order of events. She said that like she defended herself, but there were no defense wounds that she had on herself. Amongst other things, the police were just, you know, they were making up their mind way too quick, believing that this was a false story. But their mind quickly changed when uh, her brother-in-law actually came in to speak to them and say that Patty had 
some mental delays and although she was 18 years old she had the mental capacity of a 12 year old and in addition to that she was extremely extremely shy so even though he'd been in the family for a couple of years at this point as the brother-in-law he has only heard her speak maybe on a handful of times like she was petrifiedly shy so with that all being said um they kind of understood her having a hard time speaking about what happened that night right as could anybody in that sort of situation like that's a traumatic event so a week after the event her brother actually started driving her back and forth between work and home and during one of those times where they were driving back and forth patty had noticed and remembered that the car was either of green or blue exterior and while the brother was driving her he had noticed that there was like this green packer vehicle that was always in the area and he he got a partial license plate of it and he thought to bring that to the authorities with the search of it police found out that the vehicle instead of being registered to a man it was registered to a woman the woman's name was Twyla Hoffman. Twyla Hoffman, she was a 29 year old woman with a daughter and a son. She's actually married at the time, but separated from her husband and could not afford a divorce at the time. So she went on living her life. And she actually, when investigators looked into her a little bit further, had moved away from the area in which was actually really close to where where Patty was picked up on the night. So with the help of the postal office, they found out where Twyla now moved, right? And when they spoke to Twyla now in the new location back in Mesa, Arizona, she had actually has a, a slender Hispanic, you know, six feet tall, man in her life that man was named ernesto miranda when they looked into his record his record was quite lengthy and it started just when he was 13 years old at 13 years old ernesto earned his first probation charge for felony car theft and the year that followed after that he had an attempted robbery charge. The following year, Ernesto was arrested for burglary. After he was released, another charge was brought up against him for attempted rape and assault. Once he was released, he moved to Los Angeles and then got arrested for suspicion of armed robbery. And this put him back into prison once again. When he was released in April of 1958, he decided to want to change his life around. This time he was 18 years old and he decided to enroll in the army. And all within one year, he really, really messed up. He got charged for being AWOL, so they didn't know where he was. He wasn't showing up for his duties. And he also got charged for being a peeping Tom, like he was looking through people's windows. So they actually put him on six months of hard labor and received an undesirable discharge just one year later. By this time, he was 19 years old. At this time, Ernesto was working as a laborer at a produce distributor and he and Twyla were together and actually under Arizona State, they were officially common law partners. The police, they, they got to speaking to Ernesto. They, convinced them to come down to the police station. Immediately when the police got Ernesto to the police station, they did a convict lineup where they got Ernesto and three other males to line up behind a screen. On the other side of the screen, they had Patty there and they were asking Patty like, so who, who attacked you? Who, who did this assault to you? And Patty was like, mm, um, she couldn't put her, a keen 
identification on any one of the men. She thought that it could be number one, but she wasn't sure. So Ernesto now in the police interrogation room is like, so how did it go, right? Like what, you know, like what is this exactly I'm here about? And they say that there's some allegations about um, an assault and a woman that was assaulted had pointed him out, which was a lie, you know, because Patty was not sure who did it amongst the people who were standing in front of her. So it was a lie. So they were there for two hours, him and police, and they pushed and pushed until they got a story from Ernesto. Ernesto, believing that he was already pointed out by the victim, he had said, okay, I took an 18-year-old woman out to the desert and I assaulted her. They made Ernesto sign a paper. Uh, this paper in the top right-hand corner stated that, you know, the police did tell the you know, person in the chair, in the Ernesto's chair, that he had a right to, you know, request an attorney and that he had the right to not self-incriminate himself. And he signed this legal document admitting to the fact that he did do this rape and kidnapping and this burglary of the $4. He signed on this piece of paper saying that he did this and that he acknowledges that. But although those things were never said out loud to him, they were just written on the legal document. And the police did something really, really, really messed up. They orchestrated somehow, they orchestrated where they got, they got Patty right outside of the interrogation door. And right as Ernesto was leaving, he he was leaving the interrogation room and he's like, yeah, yeah, that, 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 that's a girl. That's the girl that I assaulted. So he literally really confirmed that although Patty wasn't sure, he knew that that was the female that he went and attacked that night. So on March 13, 1963, police arrested Ernesto for the assault burglary and kidnapping that had happened to Patty McGee. Just to keep him in the holding center for now, they arrested him for 10 days and moved him to a county jail because he failed to register as an ex-convict when he moved back to the state of Arizona after his crimes he had committed in Los Angeles. So Ernesto was convicted of robbery on June 1963 and that was for the burglary of the four dollars for patty mcgee and following just the next day his trial began for the assault and kidnapping of patty mcgee at the trial which took place in maricopa county arizona in june of 1963 the lawyer appointed to help ernesto during this trial was Alvin Moore and Alvin Moore was 73 at this time. He was a long time defense attorney and he had seen a lot through his career. I read something like he's done over 30 cases in his whole career for like assault charges, very serious cases, and only like one was ever convicted of their crime so what he believed I, I i can only imagine that he believed is like he got a lot of people out of these serious serious charges you know so that was probably weighing a toll of him more looked at ernesto and saw you know the trail of you know bad crimes that he was committing from when he was a youth to now and he tried for an insanity plea he tried, maybe like there is a reason behind all this, but nope, Ernesto's test came back clean. He was totally sane, not in the case. So then Moore looked at how he can try to throw out this confession. 
So his lawyer tried to argue that an attorney should have been a, a witness to when he was making his confession and he referenced Gideon and Rain White as the reason behind it. Gideon and Rain White was a Supreme Court ruling that an attorney has to be appointed to somebody if they cannot afford one. Even if this person could not afford one, didn't have a dollar to their name, doesn't matter. The Supreme Court US law mandates that attorney will be provided for them. There's obviously people who don't want an attorney and will do it themselves. That is still an option. And the judge in this trial, Judge Yale McFay, he just, he's like, this, this doesn't count right now. Currently, you are the attorney, Moore, being, Alvin Moore being the attorney, and you are representing your client. Your client has an attorney in the trial. Like, that does not make sense right now. These, these confessions are admissible within the court of law because it has nothing to do with Gideon versus Wainwright. And these, and the attorney is here. So that doesn't make any sense. So he dismissed him trying to get the confessions out of the case. Patty stood on the stand. She was extremely nervous, but she did as much as she could do, you know? She stated what she had remembered that had occurred. Ernesto committed this crime with the confession as the evidence and Patty standing on the stand. The judge allowed the jury to deliberate, but before he allowed the jury to deliberate, he had told them that if they believe for any sort of reason that the confession was coerced or pulled from, you know, Ernesto by force, that they can throw out the confession all entirely. But the jury deliberated and they believed the confession and they decided to say that Ernesto is guilty of this crime. The judge ended up sentencing him it between 20 to 30 years for each of the crimes that was committed. Moore could not get over the fact that this judge couldn't see past the fact that Miranda wasn't told, you know, his rights before he began to confess to the crimes. And that that was the sole reason why they had so much evidence, in quotation marks, circumstantial evidence, to convict Ernesto of these crimes. And although Moore is not saying that Ernesto is not a guilty man. If he had knowledge that he could have not said anything at all, he may have not been convicted and sentenced these 60 some years. So he brought this case up for appeal to the Arizona Supreme Court. He was like, was this statement made a voluntarily statement made from Ernesto or was he also provided the right attorney privileges to to have advice. So it took a while, but in June of 1965, it made its way all the way up to the US Supreme Court, but it was declined. It compared its ruling to a similar ruling called Escobedo versus Illinois. It was like this ruling where due to one of the points being that the defendant must ask for an attorney be denied one. So in Ernesto's case, he never asked for an attorney, right? And therefore he was never denied one. So that was one of the points that failed when they were looking at, can this, can this case be a different ruling alternatively or did did they do all safeguards to protect Miranda from any sort of you know unlawful convictions and they felt as though they did but this wasn't true because yes of course he never asked for an attorney so he's never denied one but just because he didn't ask for an attorney doesn't mean that he couldn't be 
of benefit to an attorney's advice during this whole interrogation. He could have been. So the ACLU got involved and they thought that, you know, this shouldn't have been denied by the US Supreme Court. There was much more to this case that could be covered because the Escobar versus Illinois ruling was so specific. There was like so specific rules on it that must happen for a conviction to just not be admissible within court. And it was because of that one point, his, his conviction could not, his confession could not be um, entered as unwillingly, un unlawfully. So it was very messed up if you think about it. At this time, it's two years down the line and more, Alvin Moore, you know, his health is declining and mentally declining too with all the things that he's been through in his law career. And he, he's just like, he can't take this case any further than it already is, right? So he's decided to step back. Robert J. Corkin stepped in on behalf of Moore leaving and him and uh, there are three lawyers and they wrote a 2,500 word petition that focused on ignorance of the law is no excuse. Like you should know what's legal, what's illegal. Ignorance of your rights are not. Like you should know whether or not what you can say or not say when you're put, placed in that sort of situation like Ernesto was. So the Supreme Court granted this and they looked at a few other cases that were of a similar context, acknowledging that they could be silent and not speak of anything, have their Fifth Amendment right, which to say your Fifth Amendment right is to not say anything that will self-incriminate yourself and your Sixth Amendment right is to have an attorney present. So the argument was this, whether a suspect needed the right to know of counsel or that police would have to advise them of it. Essentially like someone's background, lack of knowledge, first time being arrested, whatever the case may be, should not underprivilege them from self-incriminating themselves towards a crime whether they committed it or not. On June 13th of 1966, the Supreme Court handed down a ruling on this case of the matter in Miranda's favor. Chief Justice Warren led the Supreme Court as they began to look for cases that would enable them to give a clearer, more meaningful rule to define the vocabulary confession. From there on, Miranda rights was established. And there were four particular points that the Miranda laws made contentious within this. It made contentious that you have the right to remain silent, right? You do not need to speak. You have the right to have an attorney present. If you weren't able to afford an attorney, just like Gideon versus Wainwright, an attorney would be provided for you free of charge and also that if you say anything right now it could be used against you during a court of law it also goes on to expand it a little bit and say if you decide to speak now and then enable your fifth amendment right of not speaking anymore deciding to stay silent that is okay too the supreme court you know they received mixed reviews on their decision. This made it more difficult for the police to definitely charge a criminal for their case if they were only going off of a confession and if that confession was was not lawfully volunteered up. Others saw it as weakening the ability for law enforcement to fight crime. So Ernesto was in prison and he was pretty happy to hear this, you know, but then the Supreme Court later on told him that this doesn't mean that you're set free, but it does mean that you'll be given a second trial for the crimes that was committed. 
And during this time, he had like a kind of like a rocky relationship with his common law partner. They were having difficulties within their relationship and he confided in her that he did do the crime and I guess it a little bit spite him. During the second trial, she admitted that Ernesto had had spoken to her about doing this crime to this 18 year old woman. He was once again arrested for the same crime and charged the same amount of time, 20 to 30 years for each of the crimes that were committed. Ernesto ended up being released from prison in 1957 and you know he he got into some interviews and felt a little bit famous you know his name was behind this whole ruling he even like got these made cards that wrote the Miranda rights on it and it had a signature and they were laminated and he would sell them for a dollar fifty cents each you know, he fell back into the same bad habits, the same bad crimes. He got arrested again. Ernesto had a possession of a fire weapon and during the time that he was on probation and he was sent back to prison for one year to serve for that crime. And then once he was released, he was still back up to no good, doing crimes as he was before. On January 31st, 1976, Ernesto was at the La Impola bar in Phoenix. He was there at this Mexican bar and a fight had broken out over $2 that was over by the tip jar for the bar. And he actually was in this altercation and got fatally stabbed to death. At this time, Ernesto Miranda was 34 years old. The alleged killer of this attack was apparently apprehended by the police. And then when the police read them his Miranda rights, he decided to stay quiet. And due to the lack of evidence and of eyewitnesses that came forward, nobody was ever charged for this crime. And I find that very, very, very ironic that the thing that could have helped Miranda get out of jail the first time was what helped a possible suspect or killer of Miranda stay out of jail. The Miranda rights has a legacy within Phoenix, Arizona years after Miranda's death. The Phoenix Police Museum where there's a little art exhibit of the Miranda versus Arizona section. So there's over 108 countries that have a variation of Miranda rights enabled within their law system and it's been adapted and has helped probably a lot of people, you know, escape from self-incriminating themselves. For example, in Canada, they just add on another line to the Miranda rights that you have the right to call your attorney. Thank you so much for watching my video though. I really appreciate you just clicking on it and listening to it so far. If you got over to the end of it, thank you. <laughs> um, please remember to uh, like and subscribe to my channel. It really helps. And let me know your opinions or thoughts on this case and how it ruled into the law proceedings of the future. And I'll continue to post more videos like this where I'll talk about, you know, crimes that have changed law itself. And I hope you have a fantastic week for yourself and you stay safe and stay loved. Thanks again. Bye.